Good afternoon. Thank you for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Motivating Loved Ones. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. To learn more about us or access our online resource center, CareNav, please visit caregiver.org. If you have to leave early, we do archive all our webinars, and again, they can be found on our website, caregiver.org. Today, I'd like to welcome our guest, Dr. Elizabeth Liz Barnett. Um, Dr. Liz Barnett has over 15 years of experience training and coaching individuals in motivational interviewing skills as a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers. She's trained social workers, nurses, case managers, uh, among others. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Barnett received her Master's of Social Work from Boston University and her PhD from USC's Department of Preventative Medicine's Institute for Preventive Prevention Research. She is a published co-author of two book chapters and multiple peer-reviewed journal articles on applications of motivational interviewing. In 2017, she developed an online training program to help people learn the skills of motivational interviewing from home. She's currently working on a set of videos demonstrating motivational interviewing around aging topics for a family and also professional caregivers. You can find more about her at drlizbarnett.com. You can see it on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. So now that you know a little bit more about our presenter, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Liz Barnett. So hello and welcome and thank you for being here. Um, I, you know, we're only going to spend, you know, less than an hour together probably today. So we're just going to start to touch the surface of motivational interviewing, but I'm sure that you'll walk away with some, um, kind of useful tips or things that you can start trying right away. At least that's my, certainly my intention. Um, a couple times throughout the webinar, I'll ask you to, um, put something in the chat. Uh, so, you know, simple kind of either rating something on a scale or things like that. Um, so hopefully you're able to do that. Um, and then at the end, um, you can also at any point submit question and answers through there's a question and answer uh, button, I believe, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and so at the end, we will save time to answer any questions that you have in the audience or that you may have submitted when you signed up for the webinar. So. Um, with that, you know, today we're going to, I'm going to give you the basics of motivational interviewing, um, so, which is a method for increasing engagement, and hopefully with the goal of helping you become, uh, help the, your care recipients become more active and involved in their health and well-being. So, okay, next. So I like to start off my trainings talking about Bill Miller. He's considered the father of motivational interviewing. He was a clinical psychologist. He's retired now at the University of New Mexico. And he started his training in the 70s. And um, his first sort of internship was at the VA in Wisconsin. So advance a little. Um, so when he went to the VA in Wisconsin, he really just sat and he listened and met with lots of people who were suffering um, and experiencing alcoholism. And at the time, you know, he had no, at that point, he had really had no training. So he just went in to kind of meet people, listen to them. So he was using his best Rogerian listening skills, kind of non-judgmental reflective listening. And he just had sort of this amazing and wonderful experience. Um, what he later found out was that in the literature, in the, what people were saying about the treatment of people with alcoholism was always about how defensive they were and how difficult and resistant to change. And he thought to himself, well, that wasn't the experience that I had at all with these people. So fast forward, you know, uh, maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, the, now we're in the early 80s. Actually, not that far, but he's on sabbatical in Norway. So a slide advance. So at this point, he is meeting with a group of psychology students and doing some demonstrations in the front of the room. And so these students start to ask him about the choices that he makes. You know, why does he respond to this? And why does he re not respond to that? 
And what he starts to describe is what becomes later talked about and called motivational interviewing. Next slide. And I tell this story to really illustrate that motivational interviewing was not invented as a way to get people to do stuff, that it really, for some people, is pretty natural, um, you know, a way of responding and listening that kind of draws people out. And then for some of us, next slide, it's very learnable. So if you think of it as a lot like tennis, it's got some really basic skills but to get good at it, it takes really a lot of practice. Uh, he, Miller gets asked a lot about why motivational interviewing is called that. Next slide. And he really sticks to his guns because it's often confused with motivational speaking or with job interviewing, but it has nothing to do with either of those things. He sticks to his guns with the word interviewing because of its roots. So inter being two people and viewing being looking together. So this picture with this map and these ladies, right, is really that side by side, you know, feeling that's so important. And also the map brings in, you know, figuring out where we are, figuring out where we, wa we want to be, and then figuring out how to get there. So motivational interviewing is two people looking together, trying to have sort of that same perspective. So next slide. Because sometimes when we're trying to help people, right? It can feel an awful lot like wrestling, right? Where you're trying to use all your energy and figure out, you know, how do I get this person to do something? And what we're going for in motivational interviewing is a lot more like ballroom dancing, right? Two people moving together, sort of on the same team, willingly, you know, they may still be working hard, they may still break a sweat, but they're, they're sort of united in the mission. So this is my first question to you. How would, if, if you're thinking of a person, right, and I'm assuming or guessing that everyone's here because there's someone in your life that could use a little more motivation. And we know this because it could be us, right? Um, so does it feel more like dancing or wrestling? Let's see if I can get some folks to, to put something in the chat. I'll just wait a minute or two. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yo, I see a lot of wrestling. Right. Half and half. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Dancing, but I have to lead. Okay. I like that. So, right. So this experience is pretty common that, you know, even though we have the best intentions, even though we've got the, you know, their best interest in mind, right. It still feels like this struggle. So that's where motivational interviewing comes in. And before I get into kind of telling you more details about it, I want to share a study with you that I think is really interesting. Um, next slide. So I recently came across this study, and it's a small pilot study. Um, so it's not, you know, so we, they actually have done the larger study, but the data hasn't been released and it hasn't been analyzed. But in this study, they we're trying to empower families to help a loved one with hoarding disorder. And they talked about what they were doing as they recruited the family member and they were training the family member as a motivator, right? Because family members are, you know, right there with the people with whatever the behavior is. So it's not necessarily hoarding disorder, but whatever it is. And we want to be able to number one, empower the family and help the caregivers right? But also, hopefully, they can serve to eventually motivate that person in their life, maybe to seek treatment, maybe for something else. So the program on the left hand, you can see they, there were these four components to the program. They taught them how to use motivational interviewing. They taught them about the hoarding disorder. They taught them some basics of harm reduction, you know, how to make things not cure something totally, but how to make it better. And they also taught them about boundary setting. And the outcomes of the study, I thought, were super encouraging, and that's why I'm sharing this. Um, you know, they found that the people who went through the study, they reported more hopefulness, less accommodating behaviors, love, less self-distraction or avoiding, the, you know, avoiding the issue, avoiding the topic. There was less fighting, less self-blame, and less venting. Which was, which was categorized as criticism or expressing criticism or negative emotion. 
So there were all these, again, small pilot study, but there were all these benefits that people got out of this program. And one of the reasons they think that this was happening is because with these skills for motivational interviewing, the more skilled you are at kind of having difficult conversations, sort of the better off things can be. So anyway, I wanted to share that before we got started. So next slide. So motivational interviewing is a collaborative communication style to strengthen a person's own motivation and commitment to change by addressing the common problem of ambivalence. So it's collaborative, right? As soon, this is that side-by-side -side feeling. So as soon as we feel like we're not on someone's team, we wanna make sure we get back on the team, stop what we're doing and sort of regroup. Then from there further, the idea of strengthening a person's own motivation, this idea that it's in there and we have to get good at drawing it out. And we also need to, quote unquote, address ambivalence. And by this, really acknowledging ambivalence, understanding ambivalence, and ambivalence in this case is feeling two ways about something. So two ways about the behavior change. So two ways about, you know, having someone come in the home to help, or two ways about exercising more. On the one hand, I want to, and on the other hand, I can't, or it's too much, or I'm in too much pain. Right, so um, it's collaborative. We assume that people have the motivation and we're gonna start off by sort of acknowledging ambivalence. Okay, so next slide. So you can also think of motivational interviewing as sort of the intersection, if you look at the three inner circles, of a spirit or sort of an, a way of thinking about people. It's a set of skills and there's a process to it, sort of a flow. Um, and then those three things are really in the service of change talk. And change talk is any language in the direction of change. So I like to say sometimes that the goal is to get them to tell us the reasons for change instead of us telling them, right? The more that people hear themselves say those reasons, the more likely they are to make a change. And that's, that's where we're headed, right? Getting them to give us those reasons. Next slide. So if you think about motivational interviewing, you can think about the rules, right? This is a, just a handy acronym to help you get through sort of the, some of the pieces of motivational interviewing. And I'm really gonna spend most of today together talking about the first one and a little bit on the others. So that first one says to resist the writing reflex. And so we're gonna talk more about that and I'll review the other ones in a, in a bit. Next slide. So what, so resisting the writing reflex. So what does that even mean? So the writing reflex is our sort of knee jerk reaction to fix other people's problems, to tell people what they should do, maybe give unsolicited advice, and maybe try to take over decision making and planning. Curious in your chat, tell me which of those sounds most like you, one, two, three, or four. One, two, and three. <laughs> Four, I, I, right, I'm seeing all of, I'm seeing, somebody said all of them. Um, okay, we're, I'm seeing some variation, but they're all essentially the, kind of the same behavior. Um, okay, so next slide. So of course, and this really may not need to be said, but why should we resist, right? So the first reason to resist is because we know it doesn't work, right? If it did work, they probably would have already changed the behavior, right? That's sort of the number one reason to, to stop. Um, now the second reason to stop is it harms engagement. It can fundamentally make people not want to talk to us or not want to have this conversation, right? It can make them avoidant. It can make them defensive, right? So oh, big picture, it just, it creates more problems. Uh, the third one, we could treat others as we would like to be treated. Right? I'm going to guess most of you don't like that stuff either. Um, and another reason to avoid it is because when we tell people what to do, it often sounds so easy. 
right? So, and then that just brings up all sorts of other things, right? Because they're thinking, they're thinking, A, I know all the things you're telling me. And if it was really that easy, right, I would have done it. So just a few reasons. There's probably others. Okay, so next one. Oh, so, so I'm going to ask you to be self-reflective. And this is just a little graphic that I think is kind of funny. Um, next slide. So I want you to answer this question. How strong is your writing reflex on a scale of 1 to 10? Oh, 10 is, I know what you should do before you're done talking. And a 1 is, oh, I never try to solve other people's problems because I got my own problems. Let's see, what do you, I see a nine, I see a three, a two, a 10, an eight. Yeah, okay, so kind of a little bit all over. There's a few people. Um, it's not uncommon, you know, to have a high score on this. Actually, next slide. So I usually say if you're a seven or higher, that this is really the place to start. And, and it's probably the place to start for everybody, right? Really making sure we have our writing reflex under control. So let's kind of go into that. So step one, you know, how do you get your writing reflex under control? So next slide. So <laughs> step one is to catch yourself in the act. So when you feel the writing reflex kick in, you know, that's when you want to stop. And it can be hopefully before you've started, but even after you've started, right? After you recognize maybe the other person is getting more disengaged, maybe you just realized what you were doing, but whatever, whenever you can to just stop. That's step one. Step two, the next slide. So is to explore. So going back to whatever that topic was that you wanted to tell somebody, right? That you were in the previous slide, you caught yourself ready to go in with the, with the explanation or the reason. Then I want you to stop and ask instead, ask the question, about what they already know about the topic. So it could be what they know about the topic, what they think or what they feel. Then of course, get ready to listen and validate, explore, like be interested in what they have to say. So by doing this, right, exploring what they know or think or feel first, it stops us from telling people things they already know, right, which is often experienced as, as being as condescending. And it demonstrates respect, right? Respect regarding their knowledge, respect regarding their opinions. Just a lot of really good things happen by just that simple question, what do you already know about this topic? Next slide. Step three is to ask permission before giving whatever that information that you wanted to give was. So you might start off with something like, would it be okay if I, and then these are some options that you have, right? Shared some additional information, shared what I've heard works for others, filled in gaps, clarified, shared concerns, a suggestion, another perspective, told you what I might do in your situation, or would it be okay if I gave you some advice? I'm curious, just taking a step back, give me the number, which of these do you think would be the kind of the nicest to hear? Okay, one and two people so far are the ones. Five, shared concerns, I like that one. Shared another perspective. Okay. Um, for clarified something, right? So if somebody, for clarified something, if somebody gives you sort of an answer, like what do you know and it's not quite right, you could offer to clarify. And now which one would be the worst? The one that you're most likely, it's not terrible, you can certainly do it. Which one would be the one you're most likely to have a negative reaction to? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Eight and nine. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Yep. Pretty much everybody's saying the same thing on that. So, and I put that up there because you can, you absolutely could say, would it be okay if I gave you some advice? And that is certainly a lot better than just giving unsolicited advice. So still asking permission, you know, it demonstrates respect. It 
kind of, it allows somebody to have some autonomy, even to the extent of what they have to, they're listening to, right? So, so I love, so I love that. Um, that even with permission, right? Gave, gave you some advice. Again, it's not terrible. It's not the worst thing you could do, but it's still the one that people are less likely to, to take in. Okay, so that's step three, was ask permission before saying anything. Now, we're going to wait and we're going to assume that we're going to get permission. Now, really, only three things can happen. They either say yes, in which case, great, go ahead. And if they say no, you've got a few options. You can tell them anyway, if you really feel like you have to. You can respect it, which is wonderful if that seems reasonable, you know, given safety and other situations that, could, that this could apply to. And the third thing you could do is if they said no, you could ask them why they said no. Now, odds are they're saying no because they kind of, they have in their mind, they don't want to hear it again. They think they're going to be lectured, right? So we're really trying to avoid that. Next slide. So step four is the offer. And here's kind of the important stuff, right? Small amounts of essential information. And that's actually quite challenging to do because most people have a tendency to share a lot, right? So being very selective about what you share, sort of at all times being mindful of how much talking you're doing and how much, how quiet the other person is, right? So if at any point it feels like you're doing most of the talking, that's a great time to stop. <laughs> um, and then what you get to do next is on the next slide. But hang on, before we do that, I just wanted to go back to this idea of information versus opinion versus advice. So if you can provide information, right, it is the most neutral of all of those things, right? It has this objective feeling to it. And that's why, in, to some extent, when we looked at all those options on the previous slide, that the favorite ones were the ones that really kind of focused on information. They were less about it opinion, they were less about advice, okay? So you can keep your focus on information. People are better able to sort of take it in. Let's go to step five. And the last thing that you do in this little process is what do you think about what I just shared, right? So whatever you provided, what you offered, right? Now you get, now you're asking them, you're exploring their reaction to it. So this is such an important step and it often gets forgotten because you get to really witness and maybe even be a part of them processing this information. You want to give them space to think about it, to think of and consider this new information. And of course, you're going to be prepared to listen, validate, explore, you know, but it's an important piece of the process. So if you put all this stuff together, we get the next slide, which is giving in for what we call giving information the MI way, right? So the first one is, what do you already know about why it's important to and in this case, I said, check your blood sugar. You might listen, reflect, and validate. And if there are gaps in their knowledge or they're missing important information, then we ask, would it be okay if I shared a bit more? We wait for the response. We provide small amounts of essential information. And then we ask, what are your thoughts about what I just shared? So this, again, to kind of tie back to the writing reflex, is sort of the antidote this is, if I say to you, right, you want to get that writing reflex under control, you want to stop when you realize you're doing it, but what are you supposed to do instead? And this is a really nice way to engage in an interactive discussion about topics, about any topic, right? What do you already know about it? What are your thoughts about it? How do you feel about it? then would it be okay if I shared a bit more or shared my concern? Again, there is a place for your concerns, your advice, your opinion. You can work those in. Just be mindful when you do. Um, and then asking them to process what they've just heard.
Okay, so that is giving information the MI way. And that is the antidote for the re resisting the writing reflex. So let's go to the next slide. So the second part of the rules is to understand their motivation or their reasons to change. And this is actually more straightforward than anyone wants to think it is. <laughs> Again, it starts by not giving them the reasons, right? Not trying to convince, not trying to persuade. And rather, it has to do with asking questions that elicit change talk. So I'm get, the next slide, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of questions that elicit change talk. And then I think I'll do a demonstration or I'll, we'll use the chat again and I'm going to ask you one of them. Okay, um, so go ahead and next slide. So all of these questions, they are all nice, open, quite big, open questions. So why would you want to make this change? What are the best reasons to do it? If you were going to have someone come into your house to help, what would be the reasons? What good things would come out of it? I'm just gonna skip the scale for just a second, read the bottom one. If you did decide to, whatever that thing is, how might you go about it to succeed, right? If it's like exercise or some kind of behavior change. So these questions invite people to come up with their own reasons. And then on the other end, we just need to be prepared with our listening skills. So I want to do um, an, an example with you, and I'm going to use that scale question. I want you to think of a behavior that you personally want to change. You don't have to tell me what it is. I just want you to rate it on the scale of 1 to 10. And I just saw a question about Alzheimer's and dementia, and I my first reaction is that probably the scale is not the best question, <laughs> which you were probably thinking that when it, um, when you, when you, when you, uh, when you asked that question. Okay, so you, most of you, many of you are telling me, you're rating this own behavior you have, how much, how important is it to you to change this thing? Right? So seeing a lot of mostly high numbers, an eight, nine, a couple of lower numbers, fours and fives, 10, seven, great, right? You picked it, so it doesn't totally surprise me that it's high on your list, right, because you picked it. Um, and here's my follow-up question. What makes it as high as it is? Again, you don't have to answer that, but I want you to think about your answers. What would you say? You know, most of what you just came up with in your own mind was change talk, right? These were your reasons to make, to, these were your reasons that it was important. So just to kind of reiterate what I was just saying, so you gave it your number and I asked you the question, what makes it as high as it is? So if you gave it an eight, why not a six, right? If you gave it a 10, why not a an eight or a five, right? What makes it as high as it is? And your ideas that came to you, that's change talk, right? I'm curious, see if I get, what kind of answers I can get to this. What does it feel like to experience that change talk that you just came up with in your own mind? Good, good, bad, powerful, reinforcing, logical, honest, makes it more personal. Okay, I love, Yvonne, I see you, ambivalence emerges, yes, <laughs> right? You feel, so Linda says less hopeless. Uh, if there, Terrence, the ambivalence comes right up. Okay, well, the good news is, is that if I was doing that exercise with you out loud, right, I would be able to sort of kind of respond to some of those things. But at its core, when I say what makes it as high as it is, right, the, the first thing that should come to your mind are the reasons it's important to you. And those reasons, right, reinforce the, the, the importance of that behavior, right? So 
often giving people a chance to do that. Now, I will agree it's better in person, right, than it is on the, on the, on the chat um, or alone, right? That, what we do with that change talk is kind of how we influence what happens next. Okay, another thing you'll notice in these questions, at least two of them, um, if I had numbers, it would be number three and number six, is the word if. If you were going to, or if you decided to, right? If is a powerful word because it allows someone to imagine something without committing to it, right? It creates a hypothetical situation. So those, are, those sometimes can be very nice questions. Um, you know, even if you've had this conversation with someone multiple times and they've told you the same thing multiple times, right? If you were going to, what would be the best reasons? Actually, can I get in the chat just real quick? I'm sure this is, will be super easy. Um, what are some, what's like the main behavior that you want or need or would like this person to do? The person you're trying to motivate, not yourself. This is, now I'm switching back to you as a caregiver. Cooperate, work out, okay? Get more active, drink water, get care, exercise, be safe. Eat better. So a couple of thoughts about this. Uh, motivational interviewing or thinking about motivational interviewing is very useful and helpful when, with, when we're talking about a very specific behavior, right? So for some of you, um, I could see it, it might be helpful to sort of narrow that down to like what's one, a, a specific thing that you're hoping that they will do, right? So we, in, we don't talk about motivating people in general. We talk about increasing motivation for a specific thing. I see stop smoking. I, I see watch less TV, which might get flipped around into, you know, finding another thing to do, you know, where then you, the conversation becomes about like, if you were going to cut back on TV, you know, what other types of things might appeal to you? There's that word might, something like that. Um, so kind of keeping those ideas in mind that when we motivate, we're motivating for a very specific thing. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So there are other things that we can do that, um, small things that can be really helpful uh, to engage people and empower them. So when you're thinking about having a difficult conversation, one nice small strategy is to set a time frame for the conversation. Just five or 10 minutes, tops, I promise. <laughs> so sometimes having that small time frame will allow someone to, be, to agree to it and be able to be present when they know that it's not gonna go on forever. This is super important with like really old topics that have been rehashed and rehashed. It's a way to sort of reset. Um, another thing is to actually set an agenda. Be upfront about the thing that you want to talk about, right? That way we avoid trying to kind of bring up a topic or, you know, work it into a conversation. Right? Usually people can tell what we're up to. Role clarification can be helpful, right? So emphasizing, you know, that maybe your role is to support and their role is to do as much as they possibly can for themselves and together you know, we can really make progress something like that but it's the goal is to really emphasize um you know that you have different roles and then they're that they you know and this kind of putting it on the table that for them to have a more active role we talked a lot already about asking permission before giving advice or information. Um, menu of options, whenever possible, trying to have, give people choices, right? Also, this next bullet, use autonomy language. Emphasize personal choice and control, right? The more we can work that language into our conversation, the better. 
And then the last one is to give affirmations, right? To, to recognize people for what they're doing. And I'm going to guess that you, well, I shouldn't guess. Um, I, actually, I know one thing. People tend to think that they give more affirmations than they actually do. So research on this topic has sort of shown that over and over, that people think that they're more affirming than they actually are, which I sort of consider a personal challenge then to, um, to do it more so that at least my beliefs about myself and my behavior are sort of lined up a little bit better. Um, so I just have sort of two more slides and then I want to, then we can start to, you know, move into some question and answer. Um, so next slide. Back to the opening, right? I mentioned setting an agenda. And so I really love this picture of these hands with this butterfly because you want to have an agenda, but hold it lightly, right? You wouldn't want to squish a butterfly and you wouldn't want to be feeling as though you're forcing your agenda on somebody. And with that said, right, not sharing an agenda, right, having this lack of transparency, transparency results in a distrust and a deep sense of insecurity, right? We don't want to try to have conversations when we haven't been upfront about what that conversation is. Because even if, you know, they know us, you know, we're family, this has been going on for a really long time. There's still a, a level of kind of, what are you, what are you up to? What do you think you're doing? Something like that. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind about um, setting that agenda, right? You don't wanna be holding on to it too tightly, like forcing someone to have a conversation, um, but you also wanna be upfront and kind of giving people, you know, the benefit of the doubt, kind of inviting them into a conversation where they know kind of what the topic is. Okay, next slide. So as part of the rules, I mentioned that there's a structure to a motivational interview. And I don't expect you to really learn this. And I really, you know, I just want to make a couple of points about this. Number one is this idea that if you, like, if you like this image, that you can think about motivation mountain. And the goal is to get people up the mountain. What typically happens in helping conversations is we see this rush to planning, right? A rush to action. And we wanna avoid that because sometimes people will make a plan, sometimes, sometimes they won't, but sometimes they will make a plan, but they never were really motivated to follow through in the first place. Right, so we don't want to kind of keep kind of doing that over and over again. So instead, we're going to spend the time to what we call um, elicit change talk, right? Get them to tell us the reasons. And then, of course, we're listening to them, we're responding to them. And when we have enough of those reasons, and if you think of those reasons as really beautiful flowers, right? Because this is their motivation, it's a beautiful flower. You're gonna collect a whole bunch of beautiful flowers and present them back, right? Like, oh my gosh, look at this pretty bouquet. What do you think you'll do, right? That's the presenting it back is asking them, so what, what's next? What do you think we should do from here? Right? Giving them that power back. And that's when you wanna see the planning. So I always caution people to avoid rushing to action, right? Especially when You've probably been through this conversation in the past. Um, other things to point out on this little map here, um, over on the left, we've got our opening, right? So starting your conversation with that time frame, with that agenda, maybe the role clarification, if that makes sense to you, given the situation. Sometimes it doesn't make as much sense. Then we're talking about kind of the engagement phase or the walk in the woods, right? This is where you, maybe you're doing your best listening now we could do a whole session just on listening. And at the end, I might, I'm gonna tell you about certain things that I do where we could have that conversation, um, but I didn't get into it here, was um, you know, much about listening. But you can also see, and I think I was kind of mentioning this, the, the emphasis on the focusing phase, right? So that is really, in the motivational interviewing language, that means um, finding, really getting, 
clear on what's the target behavior, right? What's that thing that you're trying to increase motivation for? Before you can get change talk, you need to, re that needs to be really clear. And hopefully there's some buy-in, right? Which hopefully happened during that walk in the woods. Okay, so next slide is, I want to quickly tell you ways that we could keep in touch, steps, things that you could do. So first, if you went to my website, right on the front page, you could download um, a document called The Seven Secrets for Handling Different, Difficult Conversations. A few of these things are in there. I mean, most of these things are in there. There's a couple of extras. Number two, also on my website, you can subscribe to my bi-monthly newsletter. And that really um, brings up some of these topics and just kind of discusses them. The third one is you could actually join me um, in my my online on-demand program, which is called the MI Companion. So that is just a, um, it's got videos, it's interactive in the kind of, you type in a response and then I give feedback on it. You, know, you could email me for details. And actually right at the end of that line is number four. You could also join me for my next six week session starting, it'll be Saturdays in mid-October. It's one hour per week on Zoom with kind of interactive um, and then the online material in between sessions. Next bullet. It, I'm gonna base, I'm gonna set the actual um, date and time to be determined based on who's participating, you know, where people are coming from, if, depending on time zones and things like that. Um, next one. I'm looking to just have about 10 people, again, depending on how much interest, because I small groups are really nice. And then the cost is 299 with a sliding scale pricing available. So again, if you're interested, please reach out and we will figure out a way because it is my goal to be helpful in these kinds of conversations that are happening every day at home, at homes everywhere. Um, so then the last one, one more slide. And this is really, I just wanted to share with you something that somebody wrote in the online material um, program that I have. And what she says is, I'll read it to you. Uh, there's a couple of mistakes I'll correct. I'm most proud of resisting the writing reflex and not offering solutions because I was creating resistance even though it was good intentioned. I was robbing the client, so this was a work setting, from making their own discovery. Asking permission before I offered any feedback was weird at first until one client replied, thank you for asking. I hate it when people give me suggestions as if they know what it's like to be in my shoes. Had I not asked, she would have shut down. Instead, her response encouraged me to remind her she knew better because she was the expert of her own life. Okay, so with that said, um, if I would love to open it up for questions and answers. And yeah, that's probably a nice. Perfect, thank you so much. Thanks for spending the afternoon with us. We do have a couple of questions. Um, first off, and I, you did mention it in that earlier study, but we have a listener who had um, a loved one or a relative um, who's kind of has maybe the more of a hoarding, hoarding tendencies or maybe even, you know, maybe hoarding disorder. How might you apply um, motivational interviewing techniques with someone who, who may uh, have a, a loved one or a family or a relative who is, um, has some of these hoarding tendencies? So... And we, we sort of learned this from the study, but it's the same, this the exact principles that I would be talking about anyway. So this, you know, being able to engage someone, especially again, I mentioned this, uh, engage them again in a conversation that they probably had before, right? So I think really acknowledging that and, you know, again, putting it on the table, telling them that it, you know, promising it won't be that long. And then really going into it, really with your best listening skills, trying to understand the problem from their perspective, right? Find out what they would like to do about it, or if there's anything they would like to change. So you know that things are going well, right? So one of the best ways to kind of gauge how well this is going is how much talking the other person is doing, right? So we're always trying to get sort of more engagement because you won't be able to motivate anyone if you're the one doing all the talking, 
right? So getting their engagement, getting their willingness to kind of go there with you. And again, that's where the really good listening comes into play, right? Um, as, as sort of the first step in having those kinds of conversations. And then once, once you have their buy-in, buy -in, once they're willing, once they've started to share their perspective, and this is where the motivation mountain comes in, eventually you will change your questions to really focus on the flowers, right? Getting that change talk. Again, back to the, maybe the hypothetical. If you did make a change, what would be the good things that might come out of it? Okay, so again, talking to people first about whether and why to change before you go into the how and the when, right? There's a serious tendency to focus on the how and the when, and we're trying to avoid that, right? Go slower, spend your time with the change talk, building motivation, getting high enough on that mountain. Perfect. I have another question. Um... From a listener this um i'm sure you've done a lot of medical professionals motivational interviewing for um dealing with um, the public their clients not trying to um kind of offer unsolicited advice could motivational interviewing be used to help um uh, someone in the public deal better with their uh their maybe their doctor their physician or loved one's vision in terms of um, communication? So I would say the two, the two skills that really kind of translate, whether you, you know, regardless of which side of the conversation you're on, um, are, is reflective listening. So reflective listening kind of in its simplest form is mirroring back what you're hearing, right? So it's all, it's a pretty active confirmation of am, sort of, am I hearing you right? Without having to ask that specific question, right? The goal is not to keep saying, is that right? Is that right? Is that right? It's more to, through your own interpretation of what you just heard, right? If you give that back, that person will either clarify what they've said or they will um, confirm that, yeah, that's right, you got it, or they will clarify. So that's one thought is reflective listening. The other thought is around open versus closed questions, right? The bigger the question, right? The more you give someone an opportunity to explain. And if you pay close attention to the kinds of questions you ask, um, and I'm not sure so much in the medical setting, but many people have a tendency to ask closed questions. And then they wonder why they get sort of closed answers, right? So what you want to do is be able to ask a question where you can't really get that closed answer, or it's much harder. I mean, you can still get it, but it's much less likely when you ask an open question that really invites someone to, 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 to talk, to explore. Thank you. And then could you, would you mind giving some maybe everyday examples of a closed versus an open question? What people, examples of what people um, might, um, how that might uh, factor yeah. into everyday life? Sure. So um, rather than asking like, um, did you, even something as simple as, you know, did you call the doctor, right? You could ask the question, how did it go when you tried the doctor? Right? Did you call the doctor, sends the message that, first of all, there's the right answer. They know they're supposed to say yes, even though they probably didn't do it. Or maybe they didn't do it. I, sh I don't want to assume. <laughs> um, so did you, so there's the right answer. Um, it also really says what I want from you is just this piece of information. Right? Whereas the other question, the implied message is, how did it go? Like, tell me about it. I'm interested. I want to kind of hear from you about this. So that's a simple example where you can get the exact same information, but the way that you're going after the information can make a big difference. Perfect. And we have another question, and I know you've covered this in the asking people about things they would like behaviors they would like to change and then yeah. how important it is to them and also why it's important to them. 
And um, we have another listener, though, who, it's kind of a follow-up question on that. They wanted to know if, and maybe this is not, a, not um, quite in the, the spirit of uh, motivational interviewing, but they have um, a father, it looks like, who is older and wants to drive and believes he is capable of driving, but the adult child does not think so. And so their, their main concern is, is mostly, is their main concern I think would be a safety concern. So what might you answer for that question? Mm. Okay, so, um, so I, and I, I'm actually, I can see that question as well. So what, inf- um, so, so I don't have the specific information that, you know, will, will magically work to solve that problem. I wish, I wish that I did. In fact, I even have a, um, a father-in-law where this is, where this is a topic. Um, although my husband doesn't want me doing my MI with his dad so much, so I don't really get to it very often. Um, so, so, but I like the way you're thinking, right? The idea is definitely to present information. Um, and I think, I think any sort of progress that you can feel like you can make with sort of open conversations that don't result in defensiveness. This might be, a, I'm sure you have shared your concerns. I wonder if you've shared them with permission, right? Because that can actually, people describe, and kind of like in that um, little blurb that I read, um, people describe that after someone has been asked permission, people start to listen differently. So I don't know if that might apply, um, where that would be something to consider. Um, I do love these little, you know, specific examples, and I love brainstorming sort of um, approaches, kind of, you know, until we find something that feels like, oh, you know, until there's some hope, (laughs) you know, because that's really, again, this is what that research study found, was that motivational interviewing can give hope to the caregiver, (laughs) you know, that they can have these conversations and they can get a different outcome, right? So, um, well, Rebecca, I wish I had a better answer for you than that. Um, I do think that the answer is in here. Um, It would just take, I think, more than a couple of minutes to figure it out. Perfect. I think we have time for uh, one more question, and it's a question that popped into my own head. Um, we might have listeners who've realized, you know, maybe they're trying, they're trying to change what other people are doing. Maybe they're, they're going about it in a way that's maybe going to cause resistance or resentment or conflict. But what might be um, your advice if it's kind of almost a two-way street that both parties are kind of, you know, sharing advice that's maybe unsolicited they're trying to change each other's behaviors and, and maybe the, you know, the, they're, they're having kind of similar, they're in, talking with each other in similar ways. Mm. How might motivational interviewing help in that instance where someone is thinking, okay, light bulb, maybe I could use motivational interviewing to better, you know, talk with this person who's in my life, but you know, how, you know, what about them? And, you know, in terms of them doing it to me, how can this help? Yeah. Um, I think there's lots of opportunity there. um, I think there's something about putting the agenda on the table, sort of bringing this topic up, you know, as the, as the focus, right? So not just like, let me use my MI to talk about something else, but I'm going to use my MI to talk about how we're communicating, right? So again, being able to establish a non-judgmental space is critical. (laughs) <laughs> to any good conversation. So even if it, even if, um, and that many times is really the place to start because without that, you're kind of stuck in, um, you know, in resistance mode or, you know, you're stuck in a, in a wrestling match is what it is until you can create sort of a non-judgmental environment. So it might take a little bit to establish that. I think one way to establish that is to put, that on the table, right? To mention that, to recognize that this, I've noticed that this is what happens with us. And, you know, maybe we could find a way to do something different. I actually came across some information that I thought was really interesting. What do you make of it? Right? So you could actually share some of this with them 
and then just have a conversation about it. So in those, um, the seven secrets to handling a difficult conversation, I talk about that a little bit, to, focusing in on um, kind of acknowledging past, the past and things that have happened in our conversations previously and sort of making that part of the conversation and sort of that you are actively trying to move away from that. So that, that would be my, my thought on that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think we, that's all the time we have for this webinar. I'm going to put up a little feedback poll. I'd certainly appreciate uh, any feedback anyone would be interested in providing. I'd like to thank you all in participating in today's webinar presented by Dr. Liz Barnett. Um, she let me scroll back to her information right here. The FCA webinars are a free and continuing series. You can find out more about what we have on offer on the website. Next month, we're going to be talking family, con family conflict, family dynamics, and the month after November will be stress management. So again, you can find out more about our upcoming webinars on our website, caregiver.org. I'd like to thank again today's guest, Dr. Liz Barnett, for joining us today. Thank you, Liz. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to do, to continue doing work with caregivers and family caregivers in particular. So this webinar is now concluded. Um, a lot going on in the world. So everyone, please stay safe. And we hope to see you next month. I'm going to leave the webinar open a little bit if you uh, still need a little bit of time to fill out the email. But otherwise, um, thanks again for joining us and have a great afternoon.